Are we good to go? Absolutely. Take us away, Lisa. All right. Welcome. Looks like we have David and Asaluk joining us. Are there others? Not yet. Okay. So maybe they'll join us as we kind of progress. Let's get started. Um, welcome everybody to the Rasmussen Foundation Individual Artist Awards Program Workshop. And we have um, the pleasure of working with the Rasmussen Foundation and um, trying to make these grants and fellowships more accessible to people in this region. So um, it is my pleasure to be here tonight. Um, let's see here. So I guess maybe starting with some introductions of me and the, the KCC team. So I, I am Lisa Ilana. Uh, my Inupiaq name is Navra and I'm from here in Nome. Uh, my family roots come from Kayana, Kotzebue and King Island. And um, I live um, on the east end of town again. I haven't done that in a long time. It's good to be back on the east end of town. Um, hi, Asaluk, good to see you. <laughs> um, so that's a little bit about me. And Becca, did you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, so I know Asaluk. Um, hi, David. Um, I'm Becca Wanga Becca. My Inupak name is Ananuk. Um, I live here in Nome. Uh, I was born and raised here, and uh, my family Cultural Center with uh, Lisa and Tanya, um, who isn't here today, but she'll also be helping with um, processing or assisting people with the grants uh, for this year. I'm so glad you guys joined us. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Becca. Um, I'm wondering too, Becca, if you're able to share the land and water acknowledgement um, for the Bering Strait region? Yeah, of course. Um, so the Bering Strait region is the contemporary home to dozens of tribes. Kuwaik service area encompasses 20 of those tri tribal nations. As we enter this discussion and work towards strengthening our collective relationships, it is important that we also acknowledge the waters and homelands of the peoples of this region. The Bering Strait region, its islands, and its coastline are the homelands and waters of the Yupik, Inupat, and St. Lawrence Yupik peoples and have been for thousands of years. These lands and waters are alive. They provide us foods and support our way of life. Our lands and waters have influenced our languages, our spirituality, and our very beings. The Bering Sea is our home. We acknowledge and honor the homelands and waters of the Bering Strait region, the knowledge of our peoples and communities, and the ancestral and contemporary stewardship. We welcome all of you who are not from our era to do the same. Kuyana, thank you. And now it is my pleasure to introduce to you some of our uh, visitors today um, from Rasmussen Foundation. Um, and Zina Marari over here in the top left hand corner here. Uh, she is a conceptual multidisciplinary artist and program officer at the Rasmussen Foundation. And this is her second year working on the individual artist awards. And also, I'd like to introduce you to Ms. Tristan Agnora. Uh, Agnora. And the Ak is a long A. <laughs> Agnorak. <laughs> Morgan. And she is an Inupia artist uh, and program fellow at the Rasmussen Foundation. And this is Tristan's second year assisting with the Individual Artist Award. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, as uh, Lisa mentioned, my name is Anzina. Uh, I work alongside Tristan uh, in the Individual Artist Awards. Uh, I'll let Tristan introduce, it, introduce themselves properly in just a moment. Um, 
Uh, I'm really excited about uh, being able to share this virtual space and uh, I'm thankful uh, for your presence here uh, and um, uh, uh, allowing us into your virtual homes uh, tonight. I also wanted to acknowledge uh, Tris uh, Karen Lowell and Zuli Mason who are on the call. Uh, Karen and Zuli both provide program support. Uh, Zuli's been with the program for several years. Uh, Karen does our direct artist one-on-one -on -one support. So if anyone after this call, if you have questions that come up, uh, if we don't get to any of your questions uh, during uh, this presentation, uh, you can email all of us at arts at rasmussen.org and Karen will be the one who uh, responds to your inquiries first. Uh, and we will get started in just a moment with our workshop and presentation, but before we do, Tristan, uh, would you mind introducing yourself? Hi, good evening. Umanga Aganarak, Sagavan Koyak, Nagavala Koyak, Alaganina Miranga. Hi, cousins from down south. Um, my family's from Wainwright, Alaska. My family names are Sagavan and Nagavana. Um, I'm really excited to be here. I'm also a practicing um, contemporary Inupak artist here in Anchorage, Alaska. Uh, second year helping out with IAA, second year in my fellowship. I'm very excited to be here and share this space with you. And um, I know that we only have uh, two guests today, but I'm really excited. Uh, we have this recorded and this will be put on YouTube. So if you find any of this information helpful, please share this with your community members and family members, friends and family, and um, that will be available afterwards. <laughs> Awesome, thank you, Tristan. Um, so in just a minute, I'm going to share my screen, but just some guidelines for folks before we get started. Uh, of course, um, uh, uh, this is your own time, so feel free to, to get up and stretch and move around uh, as you need to. You're welcome to keep your camera on or off to your comfort level. Uh, we will have a work session uh, in the first part of the breakout session uh, of the workshopping. So, um, once we go to a break, uh, if you haven't yet, I'd recommend grabbing a, a pen or a pencil and some paper so you could do some brainstorming exercises as we go through the workshop. Um, and then of course, keep your mics muted um, up until we get to uh, the Q&A portion. We'll have two opportunities for uh, questions and answers. And we do ask that you hold all of those questions until we get to that point. So, uh, please feel free to write those questions in the chat as we move through this. Uh, and um, uh, as we're kind of reviewing the presentation and when we come back together, um, we are a small group. So uh, keeping your view selected to gallery view will allow you to see everyone um, in the square and we can have more of a direct communication. Okay, so with that, I'm going to share my screen, so uh, bear with me for one moment while I switch. And uh, we're just going to start with the presentation. Again, uh, if you have questions, please keep those in the chat and we'll make sure to get to those when we get to the uh, break. Uh, after and, and my answers. And just a little call out to uh, Famua who welcomed us into uh, the presentation today. Okay, Tristan. So we just introduced everyone into the space and we're gonna go into the history of the foundation and then an overview of the individual artists program from the uh, award and kind of the, the information surrounding it. We'll have a break time right in the middle and then we'll be in the IA workshop and that will uh, be the breakout, breakout session, session and then some other things that we can work on as well. Thank you, Tristan. And uh, it's my error. The workshop actually begins at seven uh, and we'll take a, a 10 minute break. So that was my fault, but uh, just for your own planning of your night, uh, that workshop will start at seven. So before we get started, we wanted to talk about why we are partnering with Coeric and Katigvik uh, this year. Uh, every year we look at the program and 
we evaluated in terms of how we're uh, reaching out to the community, what groups aren't represented, um, how can we do better? Um, and we realized that there were a lot of groups that were underrepresented um, in uh, the application. And there are some groups uh, that Lisa will, you know, Lisa will expand on this in the next slide. Um, there are some challenges and needs uh, that uh, we're creating some accessibility issues and barriers. And ultimately, we want the awards, uh, even though they're competitive, we want them to better reflect the broad diversity of Alaskans. We don't want this to be an Anchorage-centric uh, process. Uh, the majority of applications we get are from uh, artists working in Anchorage, but this is a statewide program. And we know that there are brilliant and amazing artists working across the state, working across disciplines. Uh, we typically get a lot of visual arts applications and we know there are artists working in different crafts and practices and so we really wanted to partner with organizations that know the artists in their communities uh, to help us learn how we can be better and better reach those artists but also to work directly with artists um, to to increase the access to programs like this so with that i'm going to bounce it back over um, to Lisa uh, to share some challenges, strengths, and needs of artists working in, in the Bering Straits and Northwest regions. And uh, for the folks on the call, please feel free to, in the chat, write some challenges and strengths and needs of your own as well. Wonderful. Thank you, and Zina. Yes, definitely. Um, so we know uh, that there is an incredible amount of talent in this region, just incredible from uh, people that play music on their guitars, that sing, that that choreograph dance, that, you know, there's groups of dancers that work together. There's just an incredible amount of creativity out in our region that we really want to make sure have access to really expanding on their art through this program. So not everybody has internet in our region. Not everybody has access to a fancy camera, right, to take the best pictures of their art, uh, because part of this application process is showing your art uh, through pictures of whatever kind um, in, in, as part of this application. So we want to make sure that people have the ability to do that. And, you know, if you have... Um, if you come from a surrounding community, or if you're even from here in Nome, if you you don't have a nice camera, that's okay. We can help you. If you don't have internet at home, that's okay. We can help you. And we're continuing to get the word out through radio and and posting flyers and and every other way we can get it out there. Um, but we want we want people to know that um, if you have only access to a fax machine. You could go ahead and fax in your written application and work with me personally and Becca on making sure you take some nice photos with your cell phone or with somebody's cell phone in your community. Um, and you know, every community has somebody that everybody knows is really good at taking pictures. So maybe you can talk to that individual in your community and also talk to me and Becca because we can work out a deal to where that photographer can get compensated for taking pictures on your behalf as well, because that's an art as well. Um, so once those pictures are taken, even with your cell phone, you can text them to me, you can messenger them to me, um, you can go to your IRA office and ask them if they could email them to me, just in any which way we can get those photographs available to be a part of your application, um, we're willing to work with you. Um, there are some cell phones out there that have some really wonderful capabilities in terms of taking pictures. So that's exciting. Um, it's exciting that more people have access to a really nice camera in the form of a cell phone. Um, Coeric can assist with taking photos. So if there are artists here uh, in town in, in Nome and artists out in the region that have uh, somebody in their community that is well known for taking pictures, get a hold of that person and get a hold of me or Rebecca and we can help make sure that really nice pictures are taken. We want to make sure that all those um, what you might consider to be obstacles to making a really nice application to Rasmussen are just like blown away. We want to make sure that your application is spectacular and we will help you do that. So I hope that's helpful. 
That's great, Lisa. Thank you so much. Tristan, before we move on, do you have any thoughts to add about uh, some of the conversations we've been having over the last couple of weeks? I think we've seen a real richness in, um, in art across Alaska, whether that's here in Anchorage with unrepresented communities here in Anchorage or unrepresented communities out in rural Alaska. And that's a real, really big strength that I think Alaska has, that we're, we're rich in culture um, and we're rich in, in beautiful art and uh, in various art forms from dance and music to visual arts to carving. And um, I think it's really important to hone in on these strengths and uh, uplift each other, especially as community artists. Um, I think Alaska is very community driven. We wanna help each other out as artists and um, uh, here at Rasmussen, just the just us being practicing artists, we understand that that community need, and um, working with uh, different entities across Alaska, uh, really trying to um, champion those strengths and be able to bring in applications that are not only strong but also reflect the richness richness and culture that we have. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tristan. Um, you know, I'll just add that we, we also wanna hear from you. Um, we take your feedback seriously and we make improvements to the program every year. And we'll talk about some of the changes we made over the last couple of years, but we take your feedback and your experiences seriously. Uh, you know, Tristan and I and Karen are practicing artists. so. We kind of look at this from the lens of the foundation, but also as artists working in this field. Um, so uh, we encourage you to reach out to us. If uh, something comes up after this, uh, that's a challenge you've had, email us again, arts at rasmussen.org. But we wanna hear back from you and we wanna continue uh, to improve and do better and, and make this, this entire process more accessible. So before we kind of jump into the individual artist awards, uh, some of you may be familiar with the Rasmussen Foundation and some may not. So we're, we're just gonna give a real quick uh, overview of the history of how the foundation came to be in Alaska. And the foundation can actually be rooted to Yakutat uh, in the 50s. And this is when Jenny Olson Rasmussen, uh, who was a Swedish immigrant, immigrated to Alaska as a missionary uh, and she then met her husband, E.A. Rasmussen, who had also immigrated to Alaska, and he was a teacher. And so they met in Yakutat. Uh, that's where they had their son, Elmer Rasmussen. Uh, they went on to run the Bank of Alaska, and this is where they um, started developing much of their wealth. Uh, and then when Elmer passed away in 2000, he left that wealth to the Family Foundation. And the overall mission of the foundation is to make a better life for all Alaskans. Uh, in a moment, Tristan will talk about the many ways that uh, the foundation does that. Uh, but the foundation's uh, values in the arts uh, started early with Elmer uh, uh, starting uh, collecting artworks uh, from Alaska Native and Indigenous artists when he noticed that folks from out of town were buying these art, uh, art pieces and artifacts and taking them out of the state. And so he created a small museum uh, within the Wells Fargo Bank now in Anchorage uh, that is of this collection of artwork. And so artwork has been a cornerstone of a value system for the foundation. Uh, and then in 2004, uh, as part of that mission to make a better life for Alaskans, uh, the foundation invested in a, in a full initiative for arts and culture. And um, uh, Tristan will speak just a little bit more about that. So this is a nice little um, example, or I guess an infographic a little bit on how uh, Rasmussen funds kind of arts and culture investment. So I, as, in, and as Encina um, said in 2004, we started the Arts and Culture Initiative, and that was really to help individual artists. So you 
have those individual artists within that bubble. We also uh, assist on organizational level, so nonprofits across Alaska. We do fund a lot of all our arts and culture investment in organizations. And then on a larger kind of statewide um, aspect with communities. So working, partnering um, with Quarric right now, that's a kind of a community that we're working with, but we also work closely with um, Council on the Arts and uh, working with uh, Bethel Council on the Arts this coming Thursday for another uh, workshop. So that's kind of what this looks like from an individual scale to organizational to a statewide community view. Fantastic, thank you, Tristan. And you know, it's interesting because as Tristan mentioned, uh, that part of that arts and culture initiative was the individual artist awards program. Um, and that really came out of the belief that the best way to invest in arts and culture throughout Alaska was to give money directly into the hands of artists. And this is a really unique program. Every other program at the foundation funds organizations, tribal entities, or local governments, uh, nonprofit organizations, tribal entities, or local governments. And the Individual Artist Award is really the only award that funds individuals. Uh, the other programs that uh, the foundation runs invest in uh, health and social services and education, um, in homelessness, et cetera. It's really broad, um, but this is the only program that funds artists. Uh, and, and that's because in this large effort to reinvest in arts in Alaska, investing and amplifying individuals uh, was a priority. Um, Tristan, would you mind talking a little bit about the purpose of the Individual Artist Awards? So jumping off of what Inzina said about strengthening Alaskans' cultural resources for individuals, it's also to allow a dedicated time uh, as well as additional resources to not only that grant for serious artistic exploration and growth. So this is really providing to an individual or a group's uh, growth moving forward as an art artist or as an artistic group. So since 2004, the program has provided over 550 grants to individual artists, representing more than 50 communities throughout Alaska. Um, so despite, um, scratch that, I completely lost that sentence. So going moving forward, three awards, the one we're gonna kind of briefly touch on is gonna be the Distinguished Artist Award, but the ones that we really want you guys to focus on are going to be the Project Awards and the Fellowship. And that's what we're going to focus on today when we're discussing the Individual Artist Award. So we have the three, in the three types of awards. The first one is the fellowship, and that is $18,000. There are 10 unrestricted grants, so it's at uh, 10 under, unrestricted grants for a short-term project. The next one is the project awards. It's a little bit smaller, um, and that's $7,500. It's less competitive than the fellowship, so that there are 25 grants that are given, and that's also for a short-term project. All of these are within a year time frame, and we'll kind of go over um, what the fellowship looks like uh, in comparison to the project award, because they have different um, eligibility criteria and so forth. And then the Distinguished Artist Award is that last one, and that is a $40,000 one-time grant. It's selected by nomination. We are currently, um, we've currently closed the nomination process for 2021. So it's a completely separate uh, process than the fellowship award and project award. and um, that is selected by nomination. We're, we'll be meeting with the panel soon. And then the distinguished artist will also be uh, um, announced with the project awards and fellowship award recipients. And just a quick shout out to Lily Hope who has created uh, these beautiful uh, necklaces, award necklaces that are given to each um, award recipient. And the artist career stages that, that uh, we'll be going over are emerging mid-career and mature, and those are really important to distinguish between a fellowship and project award. And we are currently right in the middle of the application period. So that ends March 1st, and that is for the online application. And there are a few dates in between there to remember as well. And we'll make sure that you guys have that information. And Zina? Thank you, Tristan. Um, so before we move on, we just wanted to recognize um, some Northwest region artists uh, that received project awards and fellowships over the last couple of years. Um, some of these faces might be familiar. 
Um, but I'll just uh, kind of group them. We have James Domek and Holly um, Mitikuk Nordland, who are both in Anchorage but have roots in Kotzebue. Uh, we have Marjorie Tabone and um, Jerome Sacomana from Nome. We have Mark Tetpin, who's in Anchorage but is an Inupiaq artist. Ethan Lawson from Fairbanks and uh, Emma Hildebrand from Northway. So we just wanted to, to recognize and acknowledge some of these fantastic artists um, uh, from the last couple of years. And we have our artists, if you wanted to look at the types of uh, projects or types of artists that have received awards, uh, we highlight the artists uh, back to 2017 on our website. So you can always look to see if there's a familiar face or you can, we, I, we recommend you reach out to someone to ask their perspective and their process. So we also wanted to show you and be transparent about the number and types of applications that we receive. Um, in total, we receive anywhere from 300 to 500 applications. Last year, we received closer to 300. Um, Total awards given are uh, in the project award and fellowships are 35. So there's 25 project awards, uh, 10 fellowships. So it's really competitive. And we acknowledge that there are more deserving and fantastic artists working that there are awards available, um, but it is a competitive process. We also wanted to show some numbers of applications. Um, I think Lisa had mentioned dance earlier. When we look at choreography, which is artists making their own work in original dance form, we only received three total applications. And we know there are more than three brilliant dance artists working across Alaska. So that showed us that we need to do better outreach to artists in that field. And so we, ha we have partnered with some organizations that serve uh, uh, dance and performing artists. Um, you, you'll see folk and traditional arts. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, the specific disciplines. Tristan will uh, talk with us about uh, the specific disciplines we accept, but there were 10 total applications. And these are artists that are doing work that are rooted in their culture, in their heritage, in the tradition, um, in their own tradition. And there were only 10 of those applications uh, in project awards. And so we know that there are more than 10 artists working in a, in a traditional way. Um, and so we wanted to, to reach out in better ways. You'll also see that uh, visual arts is pretty heavy of all of the applications. Uh, 56 were in visual arts. Uh, and that is not uh, unusual. That has been a consistency of uh, visual arts, literary arts, and music are the biggest categories because I think those are the art forms that people most recognize when they think artist. Um, but we have uh, 11 disciplines that uh, Tristan will speak to that really can capture the breadth of art making. And just a little snapshot of uh, the similar numbers in the fellowships. And these are the awards Tristan had mentioned that there are only 10, they're a higher award amount so they're a little bit more competitive. So just to dive a little bit deeper into the project awards and fellowships, as Tristan mentioned, the project award is the smaller of the two. It is the $7,500 grant. It is a flat grant. So uh, you cannot apply for more or less than 7,500. It's available to all career stages. Tristan mentioned an emerging artist, so an artist that is in the early stages of their career um, to mid-career, an artist that has been working for several years um, in, in, a, in a more established way, and then a mature artist, someone who's had multiple years dedicated to their craft. But any career stage can apply for a project award and also any discipline. Artists have to self-identify, so Tristan will go through what those 11 disciplines are. But any discip discipline is eligible for a project award. Therefore, one-year term projects. So something that you can achieve within a one-year time, that's the grant period. Uh, we're being more flexible with that this year because it is uh, COVID times and you know there's a lot of um, uncertainty with timelines. But we do encourage artists to apply for projects that can be done within a year. So what projects can be achieved within the limitations that we have? 
project budget is required. So you have to come up with estimates for that $7,500. And again, there's about 25 awards granted. Um, so it, it is competitive. We know that there are great artists that don't get awarded every year. The fellowships are the larger of the two. Uh, they are the $18,000 grants. These are considered more unrestricted. So although we do require an artist to tell, still let us know what they're gonna do within that year, it's a little bit more flexible in that the artist doesn't have to provide a budget and their project can be a little bit more flexible than the project award. It is only available to more advanced level artists. So artists at mid-career or mature and those categories um, are, are really self-identified um, and they're, uh, they're really individual as well. And it depends on the type of work that you're doing and what your work history in your field has been. And there are 10 fellowships awarded every year and the disciplines vary. So only about half of the disciplines each year are available in uh, fellowships, and you can see the ones that are available this year. They're choreography, crafts, folk and traditional arts, literary arts, and performance arts. Uh, and Tristan will guide us through all of those disciplines. So as Zenzina said, the, the all 11 disciplines are available for the project award. That smaller $7,500, a little less competitive, or that's available for all 11 disciplines. And then for the 18,000 um, uh, more um, competitive grant that is going to be just the top five. So it switches each year. So if there is a discipline that you're looking at towards a fellowship, and we are not in that fellowship year, uh, definitely reach out to us and you might be um, better to apply next year uh, within the discipline within that fellowship year. So if you have any questions about that, definitely reach out to us um, or review the guidelines and make that decision for yourself. So we, we do, these are self-identified. So you do have to identify which discipline you're in. And we understand that a lot of these overlap. Um, choreography, if you are a traditional dancer, uh, that can fit under choreography, it can fit under performance art, it can fit under folk and traditional art. So it really just depends on what you feel like, which discipline you feel like um, fits you best. So definitely look at the description for each discipline and uh, compare and contrast. If you run into a wall, reach out to us. Um, but these are the 11 disciplines that are available. Uh, for the project award. And then again, the top five for the fellowship. Thank you, Tristan. Yeah, and I would just echo Tristan's um, note about uh, reading the disciplines on the guidelines uh, and really picking the one that most connects to your practice because the panelists that initially review the applications are working in that discipline. And so if you pick the wrong discipline or uh, you apply under a different discipline because it's a fellowship year, then your application won't be reviewed appropriately. Um, so uh, just a, a quick, a couple quick notes before we move to some questions. Um, and we do encourage you, we are gonna take a 10 minute break before we start uh, going into the hands-on workshop. So if you have any questions, we encourage you to put them in the chat um, and we'll make sure that we get to those in just a few minutes. So one of the changes that we did last year is we expanded the program to groups or collaboratives. Historically, it's only been available to artists working individually, uh, but we recognized that wasn't honoring the collaborative nature of the arts and was leaving out a lot of creators and makers at uh, dance groups, uh, whether they're uh, traditional Alaska Native dance groups or contemporary dance groups. Uh, these were left out. Um, uh, artists working in a collective, uh, musicians working in a band. Um, so last year we opened up the project award and the fellowship to groups and collaboratives. So this could be a group that's been together working for a decade. It can be a group of several different artists coming together for a short term project. So they have an idea, they're gonna do it, they're not gonna work together again. A group or collaborative application is two or more artists working together. And again, it can be ongoing or um, time-based. 
Uh, what's important to note is that there can only be one application per person. So an individual can either apply as an individual for either a project award or fellowship, or they can apply as a group for either a project award or fellowship, but you can apply for more than one um, or more than one uh, type of award. Uh, there's more specific guidelines to the uh, application process for the groups or collaboratives. So we just ask that if you have specific questions about that to let us know um, and also to look through the guidelines uh, for the instructions about that. Tristan, will you take us through the eligibility and criteria? Absolutely. So the Alaska resident or the eligibility piece, you do have to be Alaska resident. So you do have to be living in Alaska for at least two years and remain a resident for the duration of the grant. So similar to the PFE and you do need to be 18 years older. This is a grant for adults and then also currently producing work. This doesn't mean you need to be a full time artist. It just means that you need to be practicing your craft um, currently. And uh, if there is a break in between um, creating art, um, we've got that, that question pop up a few times. Uh, if there is a break, just include that information within, within your application. Uh, individuals who are not eligible are going to be any individuals that are enrolled in a degree seeking program related to the arts. So if you are going to school for something completely different um, and you're also a practicing artist, practicing art outside of your degree seeking program, that's completely fine. But if you are in a degree seeking program as in within the arts, uh, you are not eligible to apply for an individual artist award. And you can also not use any artwork that was completed while enrolled in that degree seeking program under the supervision of an instructor. So if you are going to school for art um, and you just graduated, you can't use any of the work that you produced while you're going to school for art. And also the work cannot be primi primarily of research, scholarly or commercial nature. And then Zena will expand a little bit on that as well, what commercial looks like. And this is also not a needs-based grant. We understand that a lot of artists right now um, need a lot of assistance and, um, and we aren't meeting those needs. And this is, a, this is not a needs-based uh, program. This is the Individual Artist Award has um, been happening since 2004. So uh, pre-COVID, and uh, hopefully post COVID. So um, just making that note there. And criteria is going to be criteria that we also give to the panel. So artistic quality, given the experience, we're not going to compare a mature artist who's been working decades to an artist who has just been working within five years of their craft. Creative accomplishments, this doesn't mean your work has to be up in a studio. It doesn't mean that you need to, you have, you have received grants like this before. Um, it could just be community work, uh, working with youth or working, or even working with the elderly it could be um, anything or, or even teaching. So anything on that line uh, that's related to your craft. And then impact on the applicant's growth. How is this going to help you move forward? Is this, you're, are you buying equipment so that way you can take photos of your work? Are you, are you organizing your, your art space? What are, how is this going to help you as an artist? And um, there's a wide variety of, of applications that we see and, and uh, we can definitely go over kind of the vari variations of, of grant applications we see. And then also the completeness of the application. If you apply as a mature artist, but then your resume only reflects uh, work that looks a little bit more like an emerging artist, it's kind of really difficult to compare all that together. So we wanna make sure we have a consistency throughout the entire application. And um, if your application is not complete, then we won't be able to move forward, move it forward to the uh, panel. So if we are missing a, a portion of your application, we won't be able to accept it. And um, there, there is a review date, uh, which I wanna make sure that there's a slide up so that way you can reference it. So we'll be able to share that date as well. And Zena, do you wanna expand on the commercial nature? Sure. Um, yeah, thanks so much, Tristan. Um, so, uh, we recognize that artists need to make money uh, to continue their craft. And so we don't see uh, the monetary part of, of an arts practice as commercial. So if an artist is selling uh, prints of their work, we don't see that as commercial. Or if there's a musician cutting an album, that's not commercial. What we see as commercial is something that's not benefiting the individual or the group in an artistic way. Uh, one example that we often give is there's a graphic designer that works for a 
a design company. Uh, the samples that they're using for their work samples are uh, work samples they've done through the business, so logos, advertisements, and they're applying for funds to buy equipment for the business. So it's not going to improve their practice. It's not going to uh, uh, impact their growth as an artist. It's really a business venture. And so that's where we draw the line with commercial nature when it comes to art. If it's something that's mass produced, if it's something that's completely out of the artist's hands, if it becomes more of a business, um, that's not rooted in their individual practice, then that's where it gets a little bit um, uh, not uh, uh, eligible. So I'm gonna, um, I wanna uh, be mindful of time um, and let folks know that uh, we are um, going to take some questions. Um, if you have some questions, please post them in the chat. Uh, we're also posting some links uh, to guidelines and links to the website um, in the chat. So you can be mindful of that. Um, I'm not seeing any questions come through just yet. Uh, we will have an opportunity um, at the end of the workshop for questions too. Um, so I'm gonna keep my eye on the chat, but I'm also gonna move through um, uh, the presentation a little bit um, to keep us rolling. So uh, just a little note about the selection panel process, because this is also unique in the foundation. Um, so uh, Tristan and I do not make any decisions on the uh, awards. None of our staff at the foundation make decisions on the awards. We work with an outside panel. It's a different panel every year. There's about 14 or so people, sometimes less and sometimes more. And these are a diverse panel of experts from across the state um, or from across the country, excuse me. Some are artists, some are arts administrators, some work for other national foundations or organizations. And they're looking for the same thing that we're asking artists to provide. Artistic quality given experience, creative accomplishments thus far, impact the project will have on the individual's growth and the completeness of an application. The panelists that we pick are artists working contemporarily. And they are artists that have specific experience in each of the disciplines and have a broad representation of diversity. Um, so they really uh, understand uh, what it's like to work in Alaska. And we give them a lot of orientation and training. They meet with artists uh, who work throughout the state. So they get an idea of the unique challenges that artists working throughout Alaska face. The other thing we'll touch on before we take a break, and again, if you have questions, please throw those in the chat box, is how we respond to cultural appropriation because we recognize that this is an issue in Alaska as well as um, outside uh, of our state. And we wanna be mindful that we are being the best stewards of uh, Alaskans and Alaska artists and their specific culture and traditions. And so last year, we started contracting with a, a cultural expert and strategist and organizer to review any applications that have um, any problems with cultural appropriation. Uh, and uh, you know, the idea that cultural appropriation is one group of people's borrowing or using ideas or images um, or objects from another class of people that are outside of their culture and outside of their practice that they do not have connection to. And so we wor started working with Sonia to review these applications. And if there are problems, we provide that feedback to the panelists and to the artists. Tristan, do you have any thoughts to add about uh, cultural appropriation and the awards? Um. Other than uh, kind of the definition of cultural appropriation, I think uh, cultural responsible cultural sharing uh, is really contextual. So it, it depends on the community that you're from, the communication that you have with that community, but then also what that looks like at large. So we do have a lot of community members that are um, that aren't of the of uh, Inupiaq or Yupik culture that are practicing within Inupiaq and Inupiaq cultural practices. And um, the, that's just really important to look at what that looks like uh, on a state level. And um, I think it, it's really unique to the community and uh, really just depends on the connection that, that the artist has to the community. Um, so we do definitely review all of the applications for, for cultural appropriation and, and ask those 
um, kind of an uncomfortable questions of, you know, should we really be doing this, should we be, be funding uh, this person or should we look towards another community member? Um, so if you have any questions about that or any concerns, definitely reach out to us and, and, um, and uh, let us know because that um, cultural appropriation definitely, I feel like looks a lot different when you're in like a urban setting like Anchorage or Fairbanks than it does if you're in, in um, more rural areas. Um, uh, so I, it, it really just kind of depends. And I, I think because the, the panel is responding from a national level, um, they don't really know kind of the intricate nature that a lot of these communities have with, with sharing cultural practices. So just be really mindful of that and, and make sure to that your application reflects that as well. So that's just something to keep in mind. Absolutely, thank you so much, Tristan. And we'll we'll get to this in um, once we get through uh, the next couple of slides here and uh, uh, jump into the workshop. But uh, and we'll repeat this. But the application is the opportunity the panel has to meet you and learn about your work as an artist. So it's really important to present yourself as best as you can. So just a couple of different elements that come along with um, the uh, monetary award. Um, we know that investing in artists goes beyond um, a, a monetary award. And so we developed a partnership with the Ingrid Museum a few years ago to provide professional development. So kind of the workshop that we're gonna do in a few minutes, but several different types of workshops and resources really geared at developing your craft, your portfolio, your practice, your marketing, um, all of those kind of professional skill sets um, in, uh, in your career as an artist. And so that workshop is available to award recipients. Uh, we are in conversations with the museum about having that professional development also available to artists across the state. Um, and we're hoping that in the next year or two that we'll be able to release that broadly. But right now it is limited to award recipients. Um, and again, uh, we do pro we have done in the past profiles of previous award recipients. Uh, if you look on our website, uh, I think Karen has put that link in the chat. You can get an idea of the types of projects that artists have proposed and those have been uh, awarded in the past. Um, so real quick, uh, I'm going to pause us after this for a break, but we also wanted to give you a little bit more information. Uh, Tristan did note that this is not a needs-based grant. It is competitive, um, but we wanted to provide you with a, a resource, a current resource that's available right now through the Alaska State Council on the Arts. This is one of the community organizations that we have a partnership with. And this is a grant called the Adaptation and Innovation Grant Program. It's available to individual artists or organizations. And it's really um, to adapt your practice to be able to continue being an artist during COVID. So whatever, it's really, really flexible. For individual artists, it's $2,000. And it's to be able to keep doing your work. Um, and also to come up with new ways to reach your audience and to practice during COVID. Laura Forbes is the education director at the State Council who runs this program. So if you have questions about the Adaptation and Innovation Grant, we really recommend that you contact Laura. Um, it is much more flexible than the um, Artist Awards um, and uh, it, it it doesn't see the same levels of competition um, that the Artist Award sees. So we encourage you to take advantage of this resource and opportunity as well. Okay, so to keep us on track, I'm gonna pause us here and take a break. So we'll have just about 10 minutes of break time. Uh, I encourage you to grab a piece of paper, grab a pencil and pen if you haven't already. Um, I, take a stretch break, use the restroom, and then we'll come back at seven and deep dive into some elements of the application and how to move forward. All right, I'm gonna bring us back together. Uh, thank you all so much um, for uh, uh, having space for a break before we dive right into uh, the workshop. If you did have your camera off, uh, I ask that you turn it back on so we can uh, make sure we're all here together. 
Um, and uh, Karen, as we were uh, all kind of leaving for our break, Karen reminded us that if folks are unfamiliar with how to access the chat box, if you scroll to your kind of control bar on Zoom, you'll come to three dots that say more. If you click that, you will be able to access the chat. Um, and we do encourage you to use that chat as we move through this workshop um, and uh, you have any questions that come up. All right, so I'm just going to go ahead and start taking us through. So the first part that we are going to um, discuss is the online application. Uh, we do accept a paper application. Tristan had mentioned this paper application. The paper application has a bit of an earlier deadline. Um, so the paper application is due February 15th. So two weeks before the deadline. And that's so we can work with the artist uh, to answer any questions that they might have. Um, if there's anything missing out of that paper application, because it's a little bit less clear, and uh, that's something that we're, we know we need to work on. Um, and uh, Karen, uh, if you can, if you could put a link to that paper application in the chat, we encourage you to print that out, to use that as your notes, even if you're gonna submit an online application. And so uh, for this first part, if you guys don't want to print stuff out or you can't, I'm just going to say you can also email artsrasmussen.org and I can mail you stuff, okay? Great. Thank you, Karen. Um, so I'm going to turn it back to Tristan to take us through the first few steps in the online application. So this is our landing page when you go to rasmussen.org. This is the first thing that pops up. You can see the ribbon on top where it starts with grants, initiatives, news about arts, and then grants login. You can click on any of those. Uh, you can click on the grants, on the initiatives, and on the arts to get to the individual artist awards page. So any one of those you're able to get to. If you have applied before, please go to the grants login and log into your application login information. Um, if you're not, we will walk you through that process as well. But again, grants, initiatives, or even the arts, just click on any one of those at the top ribbon and that will take you to the individual artist award page with all that information. So this is when you go to grants and then it goes to individual artist awards and then it goes to project awards and fellowship, which is the, the two that we're talking about today. So the distinguished artist award again is a completely separate process. And this is the landing page on the right. You can see all of those buttons apply for IAA that will take you to the grants login, the guidelines for IAA. That's the uh, guidelines that you can either download and look at on your computer or on a different device or you can print them out. It really just depends on what your preference is. Personally, I like the paper, um, and Zena can also speak for herself as well. <laughs> I'm liking tactile things. We like to print things out. Um, so if you do need to help printing those out, definitely utilize your resources and have that printed out for you. And then right underneath that is the toolkit for artists. And that is the toolkit that we put together that um, gives you information on how, how to map out a resume. How do you take photos with an iPhone? Things like that. So that's the toolkit that we put together, online toolkit um, for you as well that normally we would pass out to these workshops, but because these are virtual, you do have to go online to our website to be able to get to that toolkit. Yeah, Tristan, and I'll just add um, to kind of tagging on what Karen noted. If you have, um, if you don't have access to a printer, let us know, let Lisa know, we'll make sure we get those documents to you. So if you are having issues downloading them to your computer or printing them out, just let, let us know or let Lisa know and we'll make sure you get those. And then this, when you go into the grants login and you haven't set up a, uh, any of your login information yet, it's going to bring you right here and the last two the individual artist registration and then the art group collective, those are the two that you're going to um, be registering under. None of us are applying as a nonprofit organization, so don't 
uh, registers up there, only the last two, the individual artists and then the art group or collective. So um, when Encino went over the fact that we opened up to also art groups and a collective for kind of that collaboration or any dance groups that you, that you might know of, you'll apply under that art group. If you are applying as an individual and you're not applying within a group, then you'll go into that individual artist registration. So make sure that you have that figured out before you go uh, and register within our system, online system. So this is starting your application. This is kind of where we're at the beginning. You see the individual artist award right up there. You'll go ahead and click on your application or you can review any drafts or any active applications that you have. Um, maybe you've applied before and you wanna look at your old applications and pull from there. Um, you can do that as well if it's still within the system. And just the dates at the bottom to, to keep in mind, again, that draft review date on February 14th, all we do is review it for completeness. If you're missing something or you accidentally uploaded two resumes instead of um, two, a resume or a narrative, if you um, upload a copy of something, we'll let you know, we'll send it back to you and uh, let you know that you do have time before that March 1st deadline to turn in the online application. And then the paper application, it is a little bit um, sooner than the online application, that's February 15th. And that's really to ensure that we get all that information in to the system so that way your application can be viewed online with the other applications for the panel. So just giving us enough time to be able to work with you to be able to put that online application together. Keep those in mind. And I'll just add a quick note about that draft review deadline that uh, Tristan just mentioned. Uh, this is a, a re review for eligibility and completeness, and we know this is only two weeks away, but we really encourage you to take advantage of this, if not this year, next year. It's on Valentine's Day every year, so, so that, is, that can just be burned in all of our brains. Um, and this is important because there are uh, mis simple mistakes that happen every year that lead to a really fantastic application not being able to move to the panelist. For instance, uh, artists might upload a document they saved with the title artist statement, but it was the wrong version. And when they uploaded it, it was a blank document. They didn't check their attachments. So when they submitted their application, their resume was there. All of the narrative questions we're, we're gonna go through in a minute was there. But when we opened their artist statement, it was blank. And that means the application is not complete and that application doesn't even advance. So completeness, even though that seems excessive, that's one of the base criteria. Should that application have gotten to us by the 14th, we, we have enough time then to look at those applications and say, artist, your, app, your statement wasn't attached. We're opening the application back up and letting you fix it. Um, past that March 1st deadline, applications are submitted as is. So this is just a quick overview of that ribbon on top of the different instruction tabs. So the instruction tabs, the table of contents, uh, the guidelines, make sure to, to either print the guidelines or have it up next to you. So that way you can go through the application process with the guidelines there on your side. So that way you can refer to those if you ever need any assistance with, with um, any technical kind of writing or, or description of uh, whichever discipline you're applying under, or even if you're not sure of what, where you are in your art, artist stage. Um, so definitely make sure to have those guidelines with you when you're going through um, this application process. So this is the instruction tab. Um, print the guidelines from here as well. Uh, and Zena, did you want to know anything on there? I don't think so. Just that a lot of the questions that we get are in the guidelines. Um, so we just really ask that you review those. And as Tristan said, while you're going through the application, reference back to those uh, because there are some specific things that need to be followed. Uh, for the application to advance. Here is the cover sheet. So this is where the award category, whether you're applying for a fellowship or for a project award, you'll make sure to indicate that your career stage, emerging, mid-career or mature, 
and then the artistic discipline. So that cover sheet has all of those vital um, informational pieces that will be able to place you within the discipline that the panel is, um, is reviewing your application in. So these are really important to you as an artist to make sure that, that you have the, the correct identification so that way your application can um, uh, be reviewed in full uh, with the rest of the applications. And if you, if you have any questions about the guidelines, if you're reading through and things just don't really make sense, um, it is a, a little bit thicker, it's, it might be a little bit difficult to get through. Um, and definitely, again, I keep saying this, but reach out to us because we're here to help you since we're not since we're not reviewing any of your applications for for that um, for the depth that the panel is the one who's who's going over the application process or the application, we can help you up to the very very end of submitting your application. So we're here to help you as much as possible, whether that's going through the guidelines or identifying any of these um, uh, drop down menus when you're going over the cover sheet. And Zena, yeah. we'll on this. On this. Thank you, Tristan. Yeah, so just a quick note about the group and uh, collective or collaborative application, because it is a little bit different. Um, in the previous slide, Tristan noted that when you first sign on, you're going to sign on as an individual or collective. That's super important because if you're part of a group and you sign on as an individual, it will be uh, a different application. Um, so again, you once someone's selected a group or collective, you'll be asked to put the name of your group if it's a time limited group or something that's really specific, we just ask for the name of the project or something that you can come up with. We ask for how many uh, leaders are in the group. So how many collaborators, and that's kind of our language within this, this application, but a collaborator is a project director and the project lead. Um, it might be a duo and they both share the same responsibilities. They both um, have leadership. So one, for the sake of the application, is the director. They fill out the application. If that group is awarded, they get the award and then they disperse it appropriately. Uh, but it might be a group of four. And uh, of those four, they all have ownership. So uh, we ask for the main number of the, uh, the members of the group that have a leadership or uh, organizational uh, capacity. Uh, we ask for their name their career stage, and if they are the person who's applying, who's submitting the application, that's the director, or if they're another lead member. Uh, but we know that groups vary. It might be a 10-person uh, uh, group. It might be a 60-person choir, and not all 60 members are going to have a leadership role. Uh, there might be some members that come in and out over the course of that year. So we consider those members at large, and we don't need to know who all of those people are. We just need to know how many members are in a group. What's important with groups and collaboratives, similar to an individual, is that if someone gets an award, they have to wait three years before applying again. So they're still eligible, but there's a waiting period, and that applies for all of the lead members of the group. So if there's four here, all four of these artists, should this project get awarded, would have to wait three years to apply again. And then just a note about the timeline and budget. If someone is applying as a fellowship project, they will not see this project budget. They will still see a timeline. So uh, for project awards and the fellowships, the panelists like to see what your timeline of pre proposed activities is. And this really speaks to whether or not this project can be accomplished within a year. Knowing again that we're going to be flexible because of COVID, but we really want to encourage artists to take on projects that can be achieved within a year and also to be mindful of backup plans and to include those backup plans in the application. For instance, we often get artists who apply for travel to attend a workshop or to attend a residency or to do research in their field um, uh, or, or research their own um, cultural roots and heritage. Uh, we know that travel is kind of unpredictable right now. So if someone says, I want to attend a workshop at the end of the year, What's the plan B in case 
uh, that workshop gets canceled because of travel restrictions. So have a, a timeline that's an estimate of what steps you will take to achieve your project within a year. And then also contingency plans if it's something that might be impacted by COVID. And if this, if this is a, a tough to rough out, again, as Tristan said, reach out to us. Uh, Karen is really great at breaking these things down and helping um, uh, artists uh, look at things from a different way. And then if you are applying as a project award, so the $7,500 award, you need to have a project budget and that total has to meet $7,500. So it can't be for less. It is a flat amount. Uh, the projects can exceed $7,500 and in your narrative, which we'll get to in a minute, you can talk about how you'll um, meet the extra cost, but in your budget, that budget needs to equal 7,500. And there's lots and lots of things that can be considered as eligible expenses. Um, there, we often get a lot of questions about what um, items can artists include in the budget. And so uh, we'll talk a little bit about that uh, when we move forward. But if you have questions, let us know. Travel, um, childcare, um, materials, equipment, um, studio renovations, uh, starting a studio, uh, getting a printer, um, uh, getting a contractor to put your website together, uh, having a photographer photograph your work. There's a ton of different items that are eligible expenses. If you have specific questions, let us know. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll let you know if they are eligible or not. Um, so the work sample. So this is gonna be different based on your discipline. Every discipline has specific guidelines on the type of samples that you can upload. Uh, in our part three, uh, we talk about work samples and give some examples of visual arts work samples that are, um, some are better and some are not. Um, but different disciplines allow for a combined work sample. So it could be a video sample, it could be audio, or it could be a digital photo. Um, and we uh, ask that you look through the guidelines for your specific discipline to see what type of samples you're allowed. It will vary. For visual arts, you can upload up to 10 images. For um, different performance arts, you are allowed to upload up to 10 total minutes of audio. So it varies depending on your discipline, but what you are required to fill out are all of these fields. The title of the work, the medium, the year, so the medium, how it was done, the year it was done, and the description. And this is super important because if this field is left blank, your application will not be able to be submitted. And we had several artists skip the description and thought they had submitted their application. It was 11.59 on March 1st, they hit submit. Um, they thought it was submitted, they downloaded the PDF and it did not go through because this area was blank. So all fields in the work samples have to be filled out. And then finally submitting. So we uh, uh, often uh, recommend that all the work you do is done outside of the application, to do it in a different document, a Word document, to write it out, to write it on the paper application, because there are so many cases where our Wi-Fi just fails, the internet goes out, there might be a glitch in the system, and if your work hasn't been saved, it could get lost. So we recommend working on a document outside and then copy and pasting it in. Uh, we always recommend to hit save multiple times, um, while you're working, you uh, can view your application and download it, but to make sure you finally hit submit before that uh, deadline of 11.59 on March 1st. And we super, super recommend not waiting until the last minute. Every year, artists are working up until the last minute and every year something goes wrong. Um, artist is working and their internet uh, disconnects at 11.59, reconnects at 12.03, and it's too late. So always save draft, always submit. And then here are those deadlines again that Tristan mentioned, February 14th, that early draft review, paper applications February 15th, and um, March 1st is the online application. 
Okay, so uh, before we move on, I just want to do a check to see uh, if anyone has a question, we're going to jump into the narrative work plan. So this is where you'll need that pencil and paper. Um, but I want to do a check to see if we have any questions from folks that are here before we move on to the narrative. I think Walter has a question. Yeah, can you can hear me? Yes. Oh, uh, yeah, my name is Walter. I'm a last night of uh, Ivory Carver. And I was just going over uh, what we were saying about the work sample. Like people like me, I've got photos of my art from the past that I've done. And I can just submit some photos if I want to from my past and then description of when I did them and stuff like that. Is that what that follows along with that work sample? I don't have to have my work with me, you know, I mean, because I'm in my shop right now and I just got done doing some stuff today. Um, but I was just trying to follow along with what you were saying about that work sample. Yeah, uh, I'm going to I'm going to mute you. There's an echo, Walter, when we are both speaking, but um, absolutely. So we're going to show some examples of work samples, but the work sample should just be your work. It should be a snapshot of one of your carved pieces. Um, and then you can upload that into the system with all of the description. So absolutely. We do say that um, the work should be within the last five years. If it's older, you're welcome to include it, but in that description to include why you're including uh, older work. So uh, within the five years, because the panelist wants to see that you're actively working and you're producing work, it can be older, but then you just need to say why. Okay. Okay, you said uh, five years, say for instance, um, I've got some stuff that I've done in the past that my grandfather taught me growing up because I started carving ivory when I was 10 years old. And, um, you know, I just replicated some lot of his work that, you know, when he first taught me when I was a kid. So stuff from way back, you know, and I still do it today, you know, with my art, my craft here, my carvings. So, and then just give you like that description, like what I was telling, what you're telling me. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Sorry, I had to mute you again. If we're, if two microphones are on, we're getting a really bad echo. So. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, if, if you do want to include some of that older work for reference, um, you can, but again, just describe why, you know, if you're including work that's older than five years, why are you including it? And it could be to give the panel a perspective of, of where you came from and where you are now, or to give a perspective of the roots of your art making, but make sure to focus on the more recent work. All right, okay. Um, so next we're gonna move into the uh, narrative plan. If questions come up, uh, just let us know, throw them in the chat and we'll make sure um, to get to those questions. All right, so the narrative plan is the written portions of the application. So you'll fill out all of those check marks that um, Tristan and I took you through on the application and then you're gonna get to four main questions. We're gonna workshop two of those questions together tonight. Um, so there will be some interactive elements um, coming up. But the first question is to provide a clear and concise overview of the proposal. So basically, what is your project? What are you asking for? And every question has a word count, so it has to be pretty concise. Then the second question is, what will you do if you receive the grant award? What is your project or fellowship focus? What are you going to do with the 7,500? What are you going to do with the 18,000? Uh, what are you going to focus on for this year? How will the proposal advance or enrich your artistic career or development? So this speaks to that criteria of the applicant's growth. How will this project help you as an artist grow? How will it help your group? grow, right? So how is this advancing your own practice 
we get a lot of artists who have questions about community work or their work that relates to the community. And that's fine. There can be a community element to your work. But we also want to know how it's enriching you as an artist. So how will connecting with the community in a way that you're proposing, how will that also improve, advance, propel your own work? And then the, a, a question that we introduced last year to really get to the root of your work and to allow the panelists to see your work is why is this work important? So why is your arts practice? Why is what you do? Why is it important? And really, we encourage you to think about this in a um, individual way. So why are you doing the work you're doing? And how can you best describe that to the panelists so they get an introduction to who you are as an artist? And then again, the timeline, the project award requires that budget, and uh, all of this is word limited. Um, so before we move on to the kind of workshopping element, um, we just wanted to go over a quick kind of reminder to keep in mind when you're working on your application. And that is to keep your messaging clear, right? That you're using um, uh, language that's easy to understand, uh, that there isn't uh, a lot of um, kind of run on sentences, um, that uh, you're describing your project in a way that's easy to understand to someone who is an artist and to someone who's not an artist, right? We usually say and recommend that people give their application to someone who's an artist and to someone who's not an artist so they can have them uh, uh, check for clarity to make sure it's concise, right? You're being really succinct about how you're describing your project, about how you're describing who you are as an artist there's consistency in the application and Tristan spoke about this. Your work samples match your career stage, it matches your artist statement, and it matches the project that you're proposing and your work samples support it, right? If someone's proposing to go on tour with um, uh, Beyonce, but all of their work samples are sculpture, there's going to be a disconnect there. And that your project, your art, your craft is compelling, right? And that's the why is this work important, right? How can you communicate the compelling nature of your work? And we know that there are compelling reasons why artists do their work, right? It's a deeply connected, deeply personal process. So how can you communicate that to the art, to the panel? And then of course, as we've mentioned time and again, that it is complete. Tristan, anything to add to those five C's? Not yet. Okay, great, thank you. All right, so for this next part, we're gonna do this, um, this says a breakout room, but we're gonna do this all together since um, uh, we are a more intimate group. So this is a timed activity um, the first five minutes might be a little awkward because it's going to be on your own, um, but we're going to workshop the first part of the application. So this is the first question of the four. And that question is, please provide a clear and concise overview of the proposal. A clear and concise overview of the proposal. So that's the question you are to answer. We're going to spend five minutes on our own writing that down. And I don't want you to overthink it. I want you to just put a brainstorm, put a brain dump of your response to this on the paper in five minutes. Then we're going to come back together and we'll have 10 minutes. We may not need all that time for the artists on the call to read what they wrote and ask others for feedback. Okay, so I'm going to time us. Um, and uh, on your, uh, you can either do this on your computer or um, if you're a tactile person, pen to paper, uh, we're going to take the first five minutes to jot down a clear and concise overview of your proposal. Five minutes starts now. Okay, and that is our time. So um, I'll ask folks to finish writing their thoughts and come back together. Uh, and we have 
three, I believe someone correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we have three artists on the call with us. Um, so I'd love to turn it around uh, to you three artists uh, uh, to introduce yourself, uh, read to us. Uh, yes, Lisa? We have four. Okay, great. Um, to introduce yourself, uh, to read to us what you wrote. Uh, again, I'll be watching our time to keep us on track. Um, and then you can hear from the other artists uh, what they heard in your, in your uh, concept uh, so that you'll understand better if what you wrote was a clear overview. Could I get a volunteer to go first? If not, I will call on someone. All right, Mary Jane, would you be okay going first and sharing with us what you wrote? I just wrote a whole bunch of questions because I wasn't really sure what what kind of proposal to do. Um, and so I just asked my, I just wrote down all kinds of questions just to brainstorm. Were they questions for yourself? Um, I guess so. Um, about my um, the variety of art that I do, um, uh, I'm still not very clear. Like um, it says, provided clear. <laughs> I'm not very clear about um, if I'm able to, uh, you know, want to build a uh, workshop because that's what I need. I need a workshop because um, I'm always working in this little tiny space right here. Or I used to work in my mom's little tiny um, porch. So, um, so I just wrote all kinds of questions. Um, what kind of projects I'd like to do because I'm, all, I'm a, um, a multi-talented artist. Is there anything you'd like some feedback from? Are we able to apply to make a, 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 a workshop? Okay. okay. Absolutely. All right. All right. Okay. Thank you. Great. So uh, what I heard, uh, Mary Jane, from your um, kind of what you wrote in your questions is um, that you're interested in building a workshop to expand your practice from outside of your house and, and you know the limited space you have to something that's bigger. Yes, because I work with uh, like 12 foot baleen oh. and it's hitting, hitting my you know, uh, couch and <laughs> when I'm cleaning them and um, I just, uh, and, I, and I make masks and I make little dolls and I, make, and I skin sew. Um, and I also do a lot of writing. Um, so I was just really throwing out questions um, like what kind of, because I didn't take time to read before. I didn't even, I had trouble. I just got a new computer and I, I had a heck of a time trying to get on this. Um, workshop here. So my son had to help me. We applaud you for just persevering and like adapting to the new technology. That's amazing. Thank you. And what I'm hearing is that you are working with many materials and you are telling stories about things that are important to you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh-huh. Awesome. Thank you, Mary Jane. And I wanted to see, um, check in with David and Asalak to check in to see what you heard from um, uh, what Mary Jane was writing and uh, sharing with us. Hey, Ariel. <laughs> I'm still trying to figure out Zoom. I've never used this before. Um, yeah, I have the same issues as her, like materials and space as well. I live in a small, in a small, very small confined space. So I have the same issues. David, what kind of work do you make? I do acrylics and oils mostly on canvas. 
You know, something we uh, communicate with the panelists um, is the um, high need for workspace in Alaska. There are so many artists that don't have access to a studio space. Um, I have a, a folding table in my living room right now with uh, <laughs> some artworks I'm working on. So um, we communicate that with the panelists about how there's just limited space available. So often mm -hmm. artists make their own. Yes. yes. David, are there any any questions that came up for you while you were working on this uh, kind of uh, brainstorm? Um, I've been taking a lot of notes. I'm kind of like a little unsure about reading anything right now. I'm still, yeah. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> I, I just would like to tell everybody, it's like this this application process is pretty industrial and, and intense. And even if this is the first time that you have thought about applying, it's worth it to go ahead and ask yourself to write responses to the questions for the application. You may not even apply this year, but it's the first step into being able to identify what it is that is important to you and what kind of funding you would like to have in your future. So even if this is a kind of preliminary exercise in thinking about how to apply for a thing, it's worth it. I, I encourage you to do it. It looks like we, um, uh, I think I'm seeing Asalak um, coming in and out. Um, Asalak, I don't know if you're in a place to share what came up for you when you were writing this um, response. Um, yeah, I had to uh, leave real quick to go pick up one of my kids from basketball practice, but um, I'm in the same boat as everyone else. I just heard about um this grant on the radio i don't know yesterday or something else and so i haven't had much time to look into it but and like the same with um mary jane i have i do a bunch of different crafts or um and then it's always different it's always you know depending on what i what i'm wanting um feel like making so um trying to come up with something that's clear and concise is going to be a little bit difficult for me so i was hoping this workshop would help me a little bit with that you know something that we that um we talk about uh, a way to kind of organize thoughts at least this is something that has worked for me and um uh, uh I've uh, communicated with other artists is sometimes it's great just to do a brain dump, just to write everything out without thinking about structure, without thinking about sentence or word count, and then kind of stepping away from it, going back, circling the words that stand out or circling the phrases that stand out for you, and then taking those separately, writing those out, and then using those as kind of a baseline and a structure to start developing more of a, a statement or um, more of a kind of a overall concept. Tristan, do you have any thoughts to add to that? Um, other than just starting, I feel like just starting the process is the hardest part, uh, just getting information down. I am um, really great at procrastinating these types of, of things in terms of writing narratives and writing artist statements for any of my work. Um, but as soon as I put down information on the paper and even just putting words down, just maybe even buzzwords, you know, community, culture, um, oil, kind of uh, anything that you can think of buzzwords that pertain to your art practice, just put them down and, and kind of make the connections between each word, each, each phrase and start from there. So you can approach it from a lot of different ways, um, but that concise portion can only happen if you get something down on the paper. So that's kind of the, the hardest part for me. So I don't know if, if, that's, uh, if that's difficult for any of you guys, but just start the process. It's not gonna be pretty, especially at the very beginning. <laughs> Awesome. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna do another exercise, um, and this is another question right out of the application. Um, I feel like it's one of the harder questions, 
um, which is how will this project advance your career, your practice, yourself? How, would it, how will it help you as an artist grow? Um, so we'll do the same exercise, but when we come back together, um, we'll use it as an opportunity to talk about what that question brought up for you. And if you had, um, uh, if you were able to get anything down or if there was some feedback you wanted from the group. Okay, so five minutes again on our own, I will keep time. How will this project, how will expanding a studio, getting the materials, building a workspace, how will that allow you as an artist to grow? Five minutes starts now. And that is our time. Uh, while everyone is finishing their final thoughts, uh, Lisa, you just posted something so lovely in the chat, and I'm wondering if you can share that um, uh, with folks to lead us into our conversation about this question. Sure. I just wanted to share that um, I'm so blessed to come from this region because I think this region is super just bursting with creativity. Um, I think of uh, how come complex the art is from this region and how it's tied to such uh, such depth um, of not just history, not just culture, but like personal, uh, that personal journey that artists um, really embark on when they're bearing their souls for us. And I just feel that that richness, that textured, complex, layered, dynamic, just really evocative beauty um, in the art of this region. And I just wanted to share how excited we are to, to help in this process, to help people really develop that expression. Thank you so much, Lisa. Okay, so now I'll turn it back over to uh, the artists on the call. Um, and uh, you don't need to share what you wrote, but maybe just share with the group what came up for you and uh, we can uh, have a discussion about that. And Mary Jane, I started with you last time. So uh, I think Asalak <laughs> might be driving. David, do you mind starting us off? Sure, I put, um, I can afford to take, um, art classes and afford better quality uh, materials and to travel to art museums for inspiration. That's basically what came to mind. Great. And you know, the one note that we would have about classes is um, you can be enrolled in a degree seeking program related to the arts. So if it's like workshops or classes outside of a degree seeking program, that's totally fine. Okay. So I would say one thing I would think about um, and other folks, uh, uh, please chime in is think about how those things will advance your artist practice. So how will that, how will taking classes, how will doing research at museums, how will expanding your um, uh, your workspace, how will those actions help you to advance? You don't have to answer that right now. Okay. <laughs> but, but that's kind of what the panelist wants to see. You know, they see the actions, but they want the artist to say, by doing this, it will help me in these ways. Gotcha. gotcha. Hey, all right, Mary Jane. Yes, um, it would advance. Right now, I have to live all in out of boxes. I uh, because of lack of space, I I put all my uh, projects in like uh, uh, either crates or um, boxes, and then. Um, but I had to move three different times last year, and so all my stuff got all disorganized. But um, but if I have a workshop, it would really help me. I could set up 
each little section for all the different projects that I do, like for, for my baleen, I like to make my baleen be really flexible so I could make baskets and, um, and boats. And, um, and then I also skin sew. I also um, etch on baleen and I illustrate, I paint. Um, <clears throat> uh, I make flowers. Um, I just like to jump around from one project to another. And this way, uh, if I have um, a workshop, I don't have to uh, dig, pull out, bring it up the stairs, unpack it, do my stuff, get it done, pack it up again, go downstairs, put it up, put it I, like my sto uh, storage place is about a, a mile away. And this way I don't have to spend a lot of time uh, packing up and unpacking and I could get a lot more work done. And, um, and have an inventory, a larger inventory. Perfect. Karen, I'm gonna bounce it to you. Um, can you let us know what you were hearing um, uh, when uh, Mary Jane was talking about uh, how that will uh, move her forward. You are on mute. I'm, I'm back. Um, one of the things that was helpful to hear is how specific your description was. And I think this is one of the most important things when you're writing these applications. You have to speak from your desires and what it is that you want. You have to name the thing that you want and then be very specific. So it's like, I have to lug my stuff from my storage unit to my house every time I wanna do a thing. Um, these, are the, these are the supplies that I have in storage that I would like to have in my house or my studio. So it's, it's, it's very clear to the panelists who are hearing this for the first time. It's like, oh, right. I totally get what she needs and what she wants to accomplish. So that was, that was, that was wonderful for me to hear about how very specific you your needs are. Great, thank you, Karen. Okay, so I'm gonna bounce it to Asalak. If uh, Asalak, if you are in a position to share, uh, if you had an opportunity to give this thought any questions, if there's anything you uh, want to share with the group. Um, I guess same as everybody else, you know, the space is an issue. Um, I've got six kids and, um, you know, I, and I just um, recently in September um, quit my full-time job to stay at home with all of them. So trying to get anything done is, um, is challenging. I mean, just when this workshop started, my two-year-old was trying to climb on a shelf and knocked it over. Um, so maybe <laughs> getting some childcare um, squared away so that I can get, um, you know, work on, work on the different things. I mean, I've been um, not, I haven't been working full time um, with my craft, um, but I have been doing it since I was two years old. So 34 years um, is, is how long I've been, you know, doing this off and on and I learned from my Aki. And so anytime that I'm doing any of this, any of my crafting or doing any, any of my artwork, um, it's with her in mind and what she taught me. And so that's kind of what, um, kind of what keeps me, you know, doing the different, the different things and I'm trying to keep it alive. I'm trying to teach it to my kids if they've got the patience for it. Um, so yeah, I guess just if I did have this opportunity, it would probably go to you know, more space and more, um, more time. Great, thank you so much, um, Usaluk. Um, and, uh, you know, we get a lot of questions that come up about, um, you know, I, I'm not a full, I don't do this full time. Would I still be eligible? Absolutely. We know so many artists are not full-time artists. There are very few 
full-time artists working in Alaska. So, so that is a very uh, eligible, reasonable um, a situation. I'm gonna bounce it to Tristan um, to reflect back what they heard you say when you were talking about what you would apply for and how this would um, help your, your practice as an artist. I think um, one of the things to really think about is uh, a lot of our a lot of traditions are are passed down and are passed down when we're really young. So I, I'm hearing a lot of um, you know I've I've done this since I was young. I've done this my whole life. You know I've I've carved since I was 10 years old, and um, and really kind of hone in on that experience on the fact that this is a living and breathing kind of aspect of your life and, and even though you aren't a full-time artist um uh by definition you are still a full-time artist um even when i'm not painting or not doing any work i'm still thinking about art uh so utilize that as a strength um and really write that into your narrative um that you that this is a uh a practice that you have been doing your entire life and um, maybe within the last few years uh, even if you are you would be considered like a mature artist uh, maybe you took your art a little bit more seriously the last five years the last 10 years and um, right in that narrative you know this is something I've been practicing my entire life but I'm really really wanting to to kind of go take a really deep dive into my practice and be able to to really focus in on this and why I want to focus in on this, why it's important to me, to you know, my community, to me as an individual, um, to my culture at large, like what is that going to look like? And those are all strengths that, that you can use. And um, it can be very easy to look at it like it isn't a strength, um, it, especially if, if it's something that you've been practicing for a really long time, um, because it, it's, it, you kind of like take it for granted until it's not there. Um, so just, just kind of reframe that and, uh, really speak to the, um, panelists because they don't, they, they might not be familiar with your, your work. A lot of them are, are not going to be familiar with, with your work and, um, or if, if any of them. So, um, write about it like you're talking to someone who has no idea what you're talking about. Um, they don't even, they don't even know that Alaska Natives exist you know, that, that type of um, approach to it and uh, really kind of speak in why it's so important to do this work, um, especially within Alaska, especially within this region. Because um, it, it's really easy to like talk about this uh, amongst our peers, but in order to get that concise language down to someone who has no idea um, other than the, the uh, uh, information that we provide for them about Alaska and Alaskan artists. So utilize that as a strength. Awesome, great feedback, Tristan. Uh, okay, thank you all so much. Uh, we know that that was a vulnerable exercise and that we were putting a lot of you on the spot and we are just grateful for you uh, working through that with us and um, uh, again, we are a resource. Uh, we are all resources for you. So reach out to us if you have any questions. All right, I'm gonna move us along. Um, uh, we are parting ways at 8.30 and I wanna uh, keep us on track. Um, so uh, the next couple of slides are gonna be about the artist statement. We're not gonna workshop these. Tristan and I are just going to talk about them. So about the artist statement and the artist resume. And, um, uh, uh, Tristan, I'll bounce it to you to introduce uh, the artist statement. So the artist statement is a who, what, where, why you do your work. Not necessarily about the project, but you as an artist. So looking at, at kind of your overall work, what, you, what you're doing as an artist, why you're doing it, and put some, the, one of the best ways that I can think of is really just putting words down, um, just talking about why you're doing it, what you're doing it, and then go through and pick out the, the sentences or the phrases that are just really vague. And we'll kind of go over into this as well. These are um, kind of a, a really kind of where to start. Like, where do you, how do you talk about your art? 
um, it's, it's really difficult to talk about your art and talk about yourself, really. Um, and a lot of these people just, oh, a lot of these people, <laughs> a lot of artists, me included, um, will just kind of, you know, showcase work and be like, you know, I, I, I make it. That's because I, because I need to, because I want to. And it, it doesn't really kind of detail exactly why you do the things that you do. Um, are you doing this because, because it uh, has some cultural value? Are you doing this to, to pass this down um, onto, you know, onto uh, your community members? Like, why are you doing what you're doing? So go into who, what, when, why, how. Um, make sure to include all that information. Uh, don't leave anything out, um, especially when you're just brainstorming. Just put all of that information in. And then again, put the, the words and ideas into order, creating kind of a structure. So just kind of brainstorming, draft an outline, make a bunch of sentences, maybe make a few different versions of your artist statement, approach it from a few different ways. That editing part, make sure that your language is clear and we'll kind of go over some language that is very vague and you wanna stay away from when you're applying for um, these types of grants. And then read it out loud, read it out, out loud to yourself read it out loud to your six children, uh, ask them, does this make sense? Um, it, you know, if it makes sense to a five-year-old, then, then it'll make sense to <laughs> one of our panelists. So yeah, read it out loud to a peer, read it to someone who has no idea what you're doing, which is kind of hard within the communities that, that we're um, working in right now, but maybe go to someone who doesn't really have an understanding of what you're doing or why you're doing, or hasn't heard that from you. Um, you know, they know that you're an artist, they know that you work in these crafts, but they don't know exactly why you do it. They don't, haven't heard it from your point of view. So just give it to other people, include other artists. Um, there was a, uh, another workshop that we had where uh, they discussed the, there was a bunch of artists that get gathered together and all looked at their artist statement and like helped each other out. And um, just the fact that we are here to help you guys uh, shows that this is like a this is a community collaborative kind of supporting system. Um, we want to see each other succeed. So uh, if you can reach out to to community members that you know are applying or that want to apply, you know, go through the workshop together because um, two brains are are better than one sometimes. Uh, sometimes. And Zena, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, um, I'll just say this is your story. This is your artist story. This is who you are as an artist. Think about it as a story of you as an artist and your overall artist self, not just about the specific project, but who you are. So really diving into those elements Tristan brought up, the, the who, the what, the why, so that a panelist walks away and they say, I, oh, I understand what type of work they make. Sometimes artists will do this great, really, really great statement, but leave out the medium they're working in. So the panelist doesn't know if they're a visual artist or a performance artist, right? So the panelist should walk away or anybody reading the artist statement should say, oh, I understand why they make work. I understand how they make work. And I understand what they're trying to do with their art making. Um, so uh, uh, Tristan was just saying these are some, we're not going to read all of these, but these are real general statements that don't give the panel a look to who you are specifically, who is, who are you as a unique creator, right? So artists will say my work is intuitive. I do art because I have to. That doesn't speak to you or your practice. Um, artists are compelled to make work in the in the large spectrum. And so make it more specific and related to who you are, make it personal. Um, and that's hard, right? It's hard to talk about yourself. It's hard to talk about your practice, but make it unique to you and avoid broad generalizations. So the next piece we wanna talk about is the artist resume. And we allow for artists to upload a resume, a traditional resume document um, that may look like this. We'll get to that in a minute, right? So it details all of your work history as an artist. But we also allow artists to write in a narrative work history, a narrative resume. And so we know that art practices vary. And some artists may have a record of exhibitions. They may have a record of residencies. They may have a record of award. Another artist may have been working under a mentor for several years or were taught by their family, were taught 
within their tradition. Um, uh, some artists have non-traditional practices in their past. And so uh, we want this to be flexible based on uh, the work that is relevant to who you are as an artist. And that is what belongs in the resume. What accomplishments have you had? What work is relevant? If you're a pilot and that doesn't relate to your art, that doesn't belong on your artist's resume. Um, if you're a pilot that takes aerial photographs and then does paintings based on your view from the plane, well, then that maybe relates. But if it's not related to your art practice, it doesn't go on your artist's resume. And so the base element of the resume is to include your contact education, your contact info, education. So this could be, uh, it could be a, a university education. We know lots of artists are self-taught or are taught within their um, culture. So whatever your roots are in establishing your practice. And then if you've had exhibitions or performances or um, uh, productions, publications, if you've had residencies or awards, uh, we know that these are not going to be the same for every artist. So those headings are going to change based on you, your practice, and your, um, your stage, right? This is going to look, a resume for an emerging artist is going to look very, very different to a uh, mature artist. Last year, Tristan put together three different templates on our website in the artist toolkit. So if you've never written a resume before, um, you can download three different templates on our website and use that as a starting point and just filling in the stuff that is relevant to you. Or you could also use it as kind of inspiration. Um, and again, you could also just do a narrative work history and narrative timeline if that feels better for your individual art practice. But this is a basic structure you know, your name, where you were born, where you live and work, and then education, if that's relevant, or other training or mentorship. Um, selected exhibitions, if you're a visual artist, if not, productions, et cetera. Uh, publications, awards, residencies, related experience. This is gonna be very, very tailored towards your specific practice. All right, Tristan, let's do a test. Uh, any can you guys hear me? Am I echoing? Good. Problem solved. Okay. Um, so uh, here are some common resume re mistakes. And again, we want we're going to be um, more flexible with the panel, uh, letting them know that for many people, this is the first time that they've applied to a grant or opportunity. Um, so things to keep in mind are order, right? Chronological order. You start with the most recent items first and then go back. So that's the order you want because the panelists wanna see that you're currently producing. So start with your most recent and then go to the um, uh, most past. Um, implying something has happened if it hasn't, if you have a show booked in 2022, but you listed it as done on your resume, um, missing contact information, uh, missing certain elements that are important to establish you in your practice, like where you did the work or took the class or attended the workshop or worked under a mentor. Okay, so we're gonna move on to work samples in just a minute, but we do ask panelists to provide feedback to the applicants. We work really, really hard with them to let them know how important this is. Um, sometimes panelists still don't give feedback, uh, but we do work with them. And this is just a, a quick example um, of some of the feedback that panelists have given. And this really speaks to those elements of consistency, clarity, having a concise, complete application that's compelling, right? Um, these are the questions you don't want the panelists to take away. Um, what subjects do you want to explore? Um, uh, what specifically are you looking to create? You can see in this question, the artist did not articulate what their project was. So thinking back to those questions and, and being able to be clear. Tristan, anything to add? No. 
Okay, so this this is one, um, right? Where, what's the magic? So we get this question a lot. Like, what? How do you unlock the mystery to getting this award or to receiving grants or getting picked for a residency? And there really isn't a magic to it, right? And one element is knowing that this is a super competitive process and there are going to be way more qualified applicants than there are awards and not getting an award doesn't mean that you are not worthy of an award it may mean that it's not your year it may mean that the panel was having really hard conversations about who to advance um, but the magic really is in presenting your best work presenting the best version of yourself and the best package of yourself, describing your practice, your needs, how this project will move you forward in the most compelling way as you can, and then letting go of that outcome, right? We often hear artists wanting to know who the panelists are, researching the panelists, and then strategizing their application to a particular interest of a panelist, but that's not gonna move you uh, further in the process. Really presenting your best self, communicating to the panel why this work is important and matters is where the magic is. Okay, so we're getting close to time. So uh, we're going to rush through the next couple of slides and then get to some work samples that we can show you um, that uh, kind of range from being good to not so good. All right, Tristan, over to you. Video and audio, some things to keep in mind for your work samples. Make sure that your video and, or your video is in focus and that there's clarity in the audio and the visual part. Um, any white balance, uh, this is um, really talking about the, the way that the video looks. Uh, so um, there should be enough contrast where you can easily tell what's going on, things aren't blown out or too dark, so make sure that, that uh, the lighting is, is, um, is good within your work sample. Sound quality, make sure that uh, the panelists can hear your, hear your audio correct or clearly, any dialogue or anything like that. And then queuing and editing, this is really important. Um, if you are submitting a work sample uh, that's three minutes long and um, you really want the panelists to hear the last minute, uh, make sure to have that cue within the description. Make sure to let them know exactly where to start or just edit it down completely to where it's within that part that you want them to listen or to view. So just keep that in mind when you're submitting work samples because you are only allowed to submit within a certain amount of time. Um, so cueing and editing, I, I feel like that's um, one of the biggest parts, big, biggest things. And again, sometimes uh, with, the, with the video and audio or any work samples, um, depending on your internet connection, you know, it, you might upload something that's not um, not clear. So make sure to just review your your um, your work samples as well. Make sure that everything that that pulls up is um, is the right size, isn't too large or too small or anything like that. I, do, I don't I believe that there's a limit that you can submit um, in terms of like video or audio. So things can't be too big, but make sure things aren't too small either. And that's where you might want to reach out to an outside source um, to utilize to utilize that uh, resource. And then written works, if you're um, submitting anything, any literary works, proofread it, uh, make sure to follow the guidelines. There are some guidelines on how things are submitted. Uh, we had a question, someone asked if you can submit um, audio of you speaking your work. And at this time we aren't able to accept that. So it can only be written work. Uh, make sure to choose the excerpts carefully. So make sure that whatever you're submitting is, um, uh, you can easily read it without needing any context, any outside context. Um, and then if you are submitting in a uh, paper or paper in Word, uh, make sure the track changes are off. Um, so there, there's a, a little portion which you can track your changes in, in a Word document um, and just make sure that that's off. So you're submitting this to the panelists clean cut uh, as is. They aren't looking at any of your other work. They don't have to, they, can, they only have to look at the work that you submit. So just whatever you're submitting, just make sure that, that is concise and that shows your best self as an artist. 
And then photos, you know, if you're if you're submitting any visual work, make sure to include a neutral background, white, 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 white black, gray. Um, taking photographs of your work in natural light tends to work out easier than studio light, but there are ways that you can um, take photo take photographs with a studio light, uh, with a with like lamps around. Just make sure that they're the same kind of color lamp. Um, and we do have kind of uh, th those tools within that toolkit as well. So that way you can take photos with your with your iPhone. Um, but that tends to work the best. Make sure they're cropped down, make sure that the lighting, it just showcases your your work. So if you were to not even look at your your work um, within your, like in your hands, if you were to just see an image of it, you know, is this the best image that I can take of my work? Um, so we do have those tips for capturing good photos within the toolkit that you can uh, download as well. And we're gonna yeah. go. Oh. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, we're gonna go through good photo or bad photo. So um, these are just photographs of um, work. Not saying that the work is bad uh, or the photo is inherently bad. Um, it's just not the best quality photo that you can present uh, to the panel. So we're going to go through this process. Yeah, and um, give us a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Um, we're just going to do a few of these because we do want to get to your questions. So for this next one, um, again, not thinking about the quality of the work, but as a work sample, give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down if you think this is a good work sample. I see a thumbs down, thumbs down. I see one thumbs up. Okay, so for our purposes, this is not good. And the reason this is not good is because it shows multiple images in one. We're not sure what we're looking at. Um, it's not a fair work sample because the artist is only allowed 10 total images. And this work sample alone has eight or nine images. So that's not, that's breaking the rules. Um, the work doesn't look finished. There's these scraggly edges. It doesn't look like it's a finished piece. So for the sake of this application, this work sample would not be good. All right, how about this one? Good work sample, bad work sample. Thumbs up, thumbs up. Thumbs up, awesome. Yep, this is a, this is a good one, right? So this is a detail shot. Uh, the artist, would maybe want to show another image of the full piece or the piece from a different angle, but this is very clear. It's in that neutral background that Tristan talked about. We get a really good, clear close up of the detail of that ceramic work. So, yeah, good. We'll just do a couple more. Good, not good. Thumbs down. Awesome. Yep. So, this is not good because. We're not sure what we're looking at. This, this photo might be finished. It might be in process. Um, there's distracting images in the background, right? You really wanna show the panelists what they wanna see, right? And so if the artist cropped this, and Tristan mentioned in our artist toolkit, we have a step-by-step -step breakdown of how to take images with, an, with a phone. If the artist cropped this just to the image, then it might be an okay photo because then we know exactly what we're looking at. Good photo, bad photo. Thumbs up, thumbs up, thumbs up, perfect. It's a good photo, right? We have a clear perspective. We see all of the elements of the sculptural piece in view. It's on that neutral background. Um, there's no blurriness, the lighting's even, it's good. Okay. Um, I'm going to pause here because uh, we're getting close to our end time. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I want to provide an opportunity for some questions um, and, uh, and a discussion and then I'll put some resources back up on the screen. But so now I'm going to turn it over um, uh, to Lisa uh, to kind of uh, talk us through some questions that maybe have come up. Um, if the artists on the call have questions, either let us know, um, uh, shout them out, um, or put them in the chat. Lisa? Hi, thank you, Anzina. Um, I haven't 
seen too many questions come through. Um, I think the participants have been uh, very generous in, in voicing their, their questions um, on the, uh, the Zoom video itself, which is good. But I just wanted to make sure that everybody understands that you know this this workshop is is really wonderful but this is not the end of you know end of it all we're here to help we're here to continue to assist we're here to continue to answer questions all the way through submission so um and like i mentioned earlier the cultural center is available to assist with uh, in-person direct assistance with that application process we're available to assist over the phone we're available to assist with even receiving faxes if that's all you have access to. And we're available to receive and forward on uh, any photos you may have. Um, and I just want to share again. Yep, thank you. Uh, email Rasmussen Foundation uh, with any questions at arts at rasmussen.org, R-A-S-M-U-S-O-N.org with any questions. Um, and again, my cell phone, my personal cell phone is 304-1195. And I just wanna make that, you know, Quark pays for that. It's not my own um, deal there. So it's a work cell phone. Please feel free to text me, message me, call me. Um, up until maybe about six o'clock in the evening, I'm absolutely at your disposal to assist with anything you need help with. Yep, and my email, thank you. Thank you, um, Becca, for putting that out there too. Um, you could email all of the KCC staff. We all received that email once it's sent there, kcc.staff at kawarik.org, and we're all available to help. Karen says she's also available to receive texts and calls um, for Rasmussen Arts at 907. 7825244 I just wanted to say real quickly too that I admire artists so so much. I don't have I, I guess we all have creativity in our own way. Uh, my creativity is um, cleaning house really good and also writing a good grant. <laughs> So that's my creativity, right? And 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 the artists that are you know able to apply for these really wonderful fellowships and grants. I just want to say that I admire you so much because you have such courage and you have an inherent ability to really open up and share yourselves through your art. And that's that's a skill that not many people have. You're very blessed to have that. And and it's to all of our benefit that you're sharing and bearing yourselves in that way. And it allows all of us to grow. So well, thank you. Also, as you guys are starting to work on the components of the application, and it's a it's a pretty robust application. It's a it's a beefy one. But as you start to think about what, what you want to say. If you need somebody to listen or, you know, get some feedback, you can just email your statement or email your project proposal and I can look at it and help strengthen what you're trying to say or just give you feedback. So please reach out. Don't, don't be nervous. Don't be, don't be scared. Okay. And I'll just say, um, you know, if you are nervous or hesitant, um, that's, uh, you know, we acknowledge and honor that as well. And uh, we know sometimes it feels really uncomfortable or it feels like you can't reach out to us. Uh, we are, we want to remove that barrier and say we are available. Um, so uh, we are just about, uh, we're a minute over time. Um, but if anybody has any lingering questions, uh, you have uh, one minute to share them. Uh, if not, you can follow up with Lisa, uh, Karen, Tristan, or myself. Um, I've just put this really great courses uh, through our state. Uh, there's a really great workbook.
I think you were breaking up there pretty badly. <laughs> but I think you're reading from the slide and letting us all know that there are these resources out there for the artists to be able to access. Tristan, did you want to share about these? Uh, no, these are just some really great um, resources, especially the Alaska Native Artist resource, the grant writing book. Um, that is uh, provided by the Syria Foundation that is such a great resource. It's a nice little handbook, um, really is able to uh, um, help you kind of talk about yourself and talk about your work um, uh, in a way that, that, we're, that we're not really used to talking about our work. And also the, the Americans for the Arts, and there's so many resources out there. And, and we, we understand that um, a lot of these resources are online. Um, so if you are unable to, to get those resources, definitely reach out to the Cultural Center uh, to be able to get those, those resources if you aren't able to access these um, with the internet connection. So that is, that is definitely a barrier that we are trying to um, overcome as much as we can, especially now in a digital age with COVID. Uh, it's been proven very difficult, but I we have a lot of really great people on the call who just want to help as many people as possible. So definitely reach out to us, um, even if it's by phone. Koyana Tani, thank you all, everybody, for um, being with us. And Zena's had a little bit of technical difficulties there um, at the at the end. I don't know. Is your mic still kind of malfunctioning there? Yeah, we can't hear you, darn it. Okay. Well, I think um, she's asked me if I could go ahead and close us out. And I just want to leave you um, with uh, my gratitude. Each of you artists that joined us this evening, um, I'm just very grateful to each of you for uh, being who you are and sharing that beauty with the world. And um, best of luck on your applications. Um, again, this is not the end. We are going to be here to continue to help you all the way up to submission date. So please get a hold of us if you need help. <laughs>